The Snowman Editorial Note Before the fatal illness of William Sidney Porter, known through his literary work as O. Henry, this American master of short story writing had begun for Hampton's magazine the story printed below. Illness crept upon him rapidly, and he was compelled to give up writing about at the point where the girl enters the story. When he realized that he could do no more, it was his lifelong habit to write with a pencil, never dictating to a stenographer. O. Henry told in detail the remainder of the snowman to Harris Merton Lyon, whom he had often spoken of as one of the most effective short story writers of the present time. Mr. Porter had delineated all of the characters, leaving only the rounding out of the plot in the final pages to Mr. Lyon. Housed and window-paned from it, the greatest wonder to little children is the snow. To men it is something like a crucible in which their world melts into a white star ten million miles away. The man who can stand the test is a snowman, and this is his reading by Fahrenheit, Réaumur, or Moses's carven tablets of stone. Night had fluttered a sable pinion above the canyon of Big Lost River, and I urged my horse toward the Bay Horse Ranch because the snow was deepening. The flakes were as large as an hour's circular tatting by Miss Wilkins's ablest spinster, betokening a heavy snowfall and less entertainment and more adventure than the completion of the tatting could promise. I knew Ross Curtis of the Bay Horse, and that I would be welcome as a snowbound pilgrim, both for hospitality's sake and because Ross had few chances to confide in living creatures who did not neigh, bellow, bleat, yelp, or howl during his discourse. The ranch house was just within the jaws of the canyon, where its builder may have fatuously fancied that the timbered and rocky walls on both sides would have protected it from the wintry Colorado winds. But I feared the drift. Even now, through the endless, bottomless rift in the hills, the speaking tube of the four winds came roaring the voice of the proprietor to the little room on the top floor. At my hello, a ranch hand came from an outer building and received my thankful horse. In another minute, Ross and I sat by a stove in the dining room of the four-room ranch house, while the big, simple welcome of the household lay at my disposal. Fanned by the whizzing norther, the fine, dry snow was sifted and bolted through the cracks and knot-holes of the logs. The cook-room, without a separating door, appended. In there I could see a short, sturdy, leisurely and weather-beaten man moving with professional sureness about his red-hot stove. His face was stolid and unreadable, something like that of a great thinker, or of one who had no thoughts to conceal. I thought his eye seemed unwarrantably superior to the elements and to the man, but quickly attributed that to the characteristic self-importance of a petty chef. Camp Cook was the niche that I gave him in the Hall of Types, and he fitted it as an apple fits a dumpling. Cold it was in spite of the glowing stove, and Ross and I sat and talked, shuddering frequently, half from nerves and half from the freezing drafts. So he brought the bottle, and the cook brought boiling water, and we made prodigious hot toddies against the attacks of Boreas. 
We clinked glasses often. They sounded like icicles dropping from the eaves, or like the tinkle of a thousand prisms on a Louis XIV chandelier that I once heard at a boarder's dance in the parlor of a ten-a-week boarding-house in Gramercy Square. Seek transit. Silence in the terrible beauty of the snow, and of the sphinx, and of the stars. But they who believe that all things, from a without wine table de haute to the crucifixion, may be interpreted through music, might have found a nocturne or a symphony to express the isolation of that blotted-out world. The clink of glass and bottle, the aeolian chorus of the wind in the house crannies, its deeper trombone through the canyon below, and the Wagnerian crash of the cook's pots and pans, united in a fit discordant melody, I thought, no less welcome an accompaniment was the sizzling of broiling ham and venison cutlet endorsed by the solvent fumes of true java, bringing rich promises of comfort to our yearning souls. The cook brought the smoking supper to the table. He nodded to me democratically as he cast the heavy plates around as though he were pitching quoits or hurling the discus. I looked at him with some appraisement and curiosity and much conciliation. There was no prophet to tell us when that drifting evil outside might cease to fall, and it is well, when snowbound, to stand somewhere within the radius of the cook's favorable consideration. But I could read neither favor nor disapproval in the face and manner of our pot wrestler. He was about five feet nine inches, and two hundred pounds of commonplace, bull-necked, pink-faced, callous calm. He wore brown duck trousers, too tight and too short, and a blue flannel shirt with sleeves rolled above his elbows. There was a sort of grim, steady scowl on his features that looked to me as though he had fixed it there purposely as a protection against the weakness of an inherent amiability that, he fancied, were better concealed. And then I let supper usurp his brief occupancy of my thoughts. "'Draw up, George,' said Ross. "'Let's all eat while the grub's hot.' "'You fellows go on and chew,' answered the cook. I ate mine in the kitchen before sundown. Think it'll be a big snow, George? asked the ranchman. George had turned to re-enter the cook room. He moved slowly around, and, looking at his face, it seemed to me that he was turning over the wisdom and knowledge of centuries in his head. It might, was his delayed reply. At the door of the kitchen he stopped and looked back at us. Both Ross and I held our knives and forks poised and gave him our regard. Some men have the power of drawing the attention of others without speaking a word. Their attitude is more effective than a shout. And again it mightn't, said George, and went back to his stove. After we had eaten, he came in and gathered the emptied dishes. He stood for a moment while his spurious frown deepened. It might stop any minute, he said, or it might keep up for days. At the farther end of the cook room, I saw George pour hot water into his dishpan, light his pipe, and put the tableware through its required lavation. He then carefully unwrapped from a piece of old saddle blanket a paperback book and settled himself to read by his dim oil lamp. And then the ranchman threw tobacco on the cleared table and set forth again the bottles and glasses. And I saw that I stood in a deep channel through which the long-damned flood of his discourse would soon be booming. But I was half content 
comparing my fate with that of the late Thomas Tucker, who had to sing for his supper, thus doubling the burdens of both himself and his host. Snow is a hell of a thing, said Ross, by way of a foreword. It ain't, somehow, it seems to me, salubrious. I can stand water and mud and two inches below zero and a hundred and ten in the shade and medium-sized cyclones, but this here fuzzy white stuff naturally gets me all locoed. I reckon the reason it rattles you is because it changes the look of things so much. It's like you had a wife and left her in the morning with the same old blue cotton wrapper on and rides in of a night and runs across her all outfitted in a white silk evening frock, waving an ostrich feather fan and monkeying with a posy of lily flowers. Wouldn't it make you look for your pocket compass? You'd be liable to kiss her before you collected your presence of mind. By and by, the flood of Ross's talk was drawn up into the clouds, so it pleased me to fancy, and there condensed into the finer snowflakes of thought, and we sat silent about the stove as good friends and bitter enemies will do. I thought of Ross's preamble about the mysterious influence upon man exerted by that ermine-lined monster that now covered our little world, and knew he was right. Of all the curious knick-knacks, mysteries, puzzles, Indian gifts, rat-traps, and well-disguised blessings that the gods chuck down to us from the Olympian peaks, the most disquieting and evil-bringing is the snow. By scientific analysis it is absolute beauty and purity. So, at the beginning, we look doubtfully at chemistry. It falls upon the world, and, lo, we live in another. It hides in a night the old scars and familiar places with which we have grown heart-sick or enamored. So, as quietly as we can, we hustle on our embroidered robes and hie us on Prince Camaralzaman's horse, or in the reindeer sleigh, into the white country where the seven colors converge. This is when our fancy can overcome the bane of it. But in certain spots of the earth comes the snow madness, made known by people turned wild and distracted by the bewildering veil that has obscured the only world they know. In the cities, the white fairy who sets the brains of her dupes whirling by a wave of her wand is cast for the comedy role. Her diamond shoe buckles glitter like frost. With a pirouette she invites the spotless carnival. But in the waste places the snow is sardonic. Sponging out the world of the outliers it gives no foothold on another sphere in return. It makes of the earth a firmament underfoot. It leaves us clawing and stumbling in space in an inimical fifth element whose evil outdoes its strangeness and beauty. There, nature, low comedian, plays her tricks on man. Though she has put him forth as her highest product, it appears that she has fashioned him with what seems almost incredible carelessness and indexterity. One-sided and without balance, with his two halves unequally fashioned and joined, must he ever jog his eccentric way. The snow falls, the darkness caps it, and the ridiculous man-biped strays in accurate circles until he succumbs in the ruins of his defective architecture. In the throat of the thirsty, the snow is vitriol. In appearance as plausible as the breakfast food of the angels, it is as hot in the mouth as ginger, increasing the pangs of the water famished. 
It is a derivative from water, air, and some cold, uncanny fire from which the caloric has been extracted. Good has been said of it. Even the poets, crazed by its spell and shivering in their attics under its touch, have indicted permanent melodies commemorative of its beauty. Still, to the saddest overcoated optimist, it is a plague, a corroding plague that Pharaoh successfully sidestepped. It beneficently covers the wheat fields, swelling the crop, and the flower trust gets us by the throat like a sudden quincy. It spreads the tail of its white kirtle over the red seams of the rugged north, and the Alaskan short story is born. Ediolated perfidy, it shelters the mountain traveler burrowing from the icy air, and, melting tomorrow, drowns his brother in the valley below. At its worst, it is lock and key and crucible and the wand of Circe. When it corrals man in lonely ranches, mountain cabins, and forest huts, the snow makes apes and tigers of the hardiest. It turns the bosoms of weaker ones to glass, their tongues to infants' rattles, their hearts to lawlessness and spleen. It is not all from the isolation the snow is not merely a blockader, it is a chemical test. It is a good man who can show a reaction that is not chiefly composed of a dram or two of potash and magnesia with traces of Adam, Ananias, Nebuchadnezzar, and the fretful porcupine. This is no story, you say. Well, let it begin. There was a knock at the door. Is the opening not full of context and reminiscence, O oh, best buyers of best sellers? We drew the latch, and in stumbled Etienne Giraud, as he afterward named himself. But just then he was no more than a worm struggling for life, enveloped in a killing white chrysalis. We dug down through snow, overcoats, mufflers and waterproofs, and dragged forth a living thing with a Van Dyke beard and marvelous diamond rings. We put it through the approved curriculum of snow rubbing, hot milk, and teaspoonful doses of whiskey, working him up to a graduating class entitled to a diploma of three fingers of rye in half a glass full of hot water. One of the ranch boys had already come from the quarters at Ross's bugle-like yell and kicked the stranger's staggering pony to some sheltered corral where beasts were entertained. Let a paragraphic biography of Giraud intervene. Etienne was an opera singer originally, we gathered, but adversity and the snow had made him non compos vocis, the adversity consisted of the stranded San Salvador Opera Company, a period of hotel second-story work, and then a career as a professional palmist, jumping from town to town. For, like other professional palmists, every time he worked the heart line too strongly, he immediately moved along the line of least resistance. Though Etienne did not confide this to us, we surmised that he had moved out into the dusk about twenty minutes ahead of a constable and had thus encountered the snow. In his most sacred blue language he dilated upon the subject of snow, for Etienne was Paris-born and loved the snow with the same passion that an orchid does. Miserable, commented Etienne, and took another three fingers. Complete cast iron, pussy footed, blank blank, said Ross, and followed suit. Rotten, said I. The cook said nothing. 
he stood in the door weighing our outburst, and insistently from behind that frozen visage I got two messages, via the MAM wireless. One was that George considered our vituperation against the snow childish. The other was that George did not love Dagos. Inasmuch as Etienne was a Frenchman, I concluded I had the message wrong, so I queried the other. Bright Eyes, you don't really mean Dagos, do you? And over the wireless came three deathly psychic taps. Yes. Then I reflected that to George all foreigners were probably Dagos. I had once known another camp cook who had thought Mons, Sig, and Millie, Trans Mississippi for Mademoiselle, were Italian given names. This cook used to marvel, therefore, at the paucity of neo Roman precognomens, and therefore, why not? I have said that snow is a test of men. For one day, two days, Etienne stood at the window, fletcherizing his fingernails and shrieking and moaning at the monotony. To me, Etienne was just about as unbearable as the snow, and so, seeking relief, I went out on the second day to look at my horse, slipped on a stone, broke my collarbone, and thereafter underwent not the snow test, but the test of flat on the back, a test that comes once too often for any man to stand. However, I bore up cheerfully. I was now merely a spectator, and from my couch in the big room I could lie and watch the human interplay with that detached, impassive, impersonal feeling which French writers tell us is so valuable to the littérature and American writers to the faro dealer. I shall go crazy in this abominable, miserable place, was Etienne's constant prediction. Never knew Mark Twain to bore me before, said Ross, over and over. He sat by the other window, hour after hour, a box of Pittsburgh stogies of the length, strength, and odor of a Pittsburgh graft scandal deposited on one side of him, and, roughing it, the jumping frog, and life on the Mississippi on the other. For every chapter he lit a new stogie, puffing furiously. This, in time, gave him a recurrent premonition of cramps, gastritis, smoker's colic, or whatever it is they have in Pittsburgh after a too deep indulgence in graft scandals. To fend off the colic, Ross resorted time and again to old Dr. Still's amber-colored USA colic cure. Result, after forty-eight hours, nerves. Positive fact I never knew Mark Twain to make me tired before. Positive fact. Ross slammed, roughing it, on the floor. When you're snowbound this away, you want tragedy, I guess. Humor just seems to bring out all your cussedness. You read a man's poor, pitiful attempts to be funny, and it makes you so nervous you want to tear the book up, get out your bandana, and have a good long cry. At the other end of the room, the Frenchman took his fingernails out of his mouth long enough to exclaim, Humor! Humor at such a time as this! My God, I shall go crazy in this abominable supper! announced George. These meals were not the meals of Rabelais, who said, The great God makes the planets, and we make the platters neat. By that time, the ranch house meals were not affairs of gusto. They were mental distraction, not bodily provender. What they were to be later shall never be forgotten by Ross, or me, or Etienne. After supper, the stogies and fingernails began again. My shoulder ached wretchedly, and with half-closed eyes I tried to forget it by watching the deft movements of the stolid cook. 
Suddenly I saw him cock his ear like a dog. Then, with a swift step, he moved to the door, threw it open, and stood there. The rest of us had heard nothing. "'What is it, George?' asked Ross. The cook reached out his hand into the darkness alongside the jam. With careful precision he prodded something. Then he made one careful step into the snow. His back muscles bulged a little under the arms as he stooped and lightly lifted a burden. Another step inside the door, which he shut methodically behind him, and he dumped the burden at a safe distance from the fire. He stood up and fixed us with a solemn eye. None of us moved under that orphic suspense until... A woman, remarked George. Miss Willie Adams was her name. Vocation, school teacher. Present avocation, getting lost in the snow. Age, Yum, yum, the Persian for twenty. Take to the woods if you would describe Miss Adams. A willow for grace, a hickory for fiber, a birch for the clear whiteness of her skin, four eyes, the blue sky seen through treetops, the silk in cocoons for her hair, her voice, the murmur of the evening June wind in the leaves, her mouth, the berries of the wintergreen, fingers as light as ferns, her toe as small as a deer track, general impression upon the dazed beholder, you could not see the forest for the trees. Psychology, with a capital P and the foot of a lynx, at this juncture stalks into the ranch house. Three men, a cook, a pretty young woman, all snowbound. Count me out of it, as I did not count anyway. I never did with women. Count the cook out if you like, but note the effect upon Ross and Etienne Giraud. Ross dumped Mark Twain in a trunk and locked the trunk. Also, he discarded the Pittsburgh scandals. Also, he shaved off a three days' beard. Etienne, being French, began on the beard first. He pomaded it from a little tube of grease hongroise in his vest pocket. He combed it with a little aluminum comb from the same vest pocket. He trimmed it with manicure scissors from the same vest pocket. His Light and Gallic spirits underwent a sudden, miraculous change. He hummed a blithe San Salvador Opera Company tune. He grinned, smirked, bowed, pirouetted, twiddled, twaddled, twisted, and touralued. Gaily, the notorious troubadour, could not have equaled Etienne. Ross's method of advance was brusque domineering. Little woman, he said, you're welcome here. And with what he thought subtle double meaning, welcome to stay here as long as you like, snow or no snow. Miss Adams thanked him a little wildly, some of the wintergreen berries creeping into the birch bark. She looked around hurriedly as if seeking escape, but there was none save the kitchen and the room allotted her. She made an excuse and disappeared into her own room. Later I, feigning sleep, heard the following. Miss Adams, I was almost to perish die of monotony when your fair and beautiful face appear in this miserable house. I opened my starboard eye. The beard was being curled furiously around a finger. The Svengali eye was rolling. The chair was being hunched closer to the school teachers. I am French, you see, temperamental, nervous. 
I cannot endure these dull hours in this ranch house, but a woman comes, ah! The shoulders gave nine rahs and a tiger. What a difference! All is light and gay. Everything smile when you smile. You have art, beauty, grace. My art comes back to me when I feel your art. So, he laid his hand upon his vest pocket. From this vantage point, he suddenly snatched at the school teacher's own hand. Ah, Miss Adams, if I could only tell you how I had dinner, remarked George. He was standing just behind the Frenchman's ear. His eyes looked straight into the school teacher's eyes. After thirty seconds of survey, his lips moved deep in the flinty, frozen maelstrom of his face. Dinner, he concluded, will be ready in two minutes. Miss Adams jumped to her feet, relieved. I must get ready for dinner, she said brightly, and went into her room. Ross came in fifteen minutes late. After the dishes had been cleaned away, I waited until a propitious time when the room was temporarily ours alone and told him what had happened. He became so excited that he lit a stogie without thinking. Yeller-hided, unwashed, palm-reading skunk, he said under his breath. I'll shoot him full of holes if he don't watch out, talking that way to my wife. I gave a jump that set my collarbone back another week. Your wife, I gasped. Well, I mean to make her that, he announced. The air in the ranch house the rest of that day was tense with pent-up emotions, oh, best buyers of best sellers. Ross watched Miss Adams as a hawk does a hen. He watched Etienne as a hawk does a scarecrow. Etienne watched Miss Adams as a weasel does a hen house. He paid no attention to Ross. The condition of Miss Adams in the role of sought after was feverish. Lately escaped from the agony and long torture of the white cold, where for hours nature had kept the little school teacher's vision locked in and turned upon herself. Nobody knows through what profound feminine introspections she had gone. Now, suddenly cast among men, instead of finding relief and security, she beheld herself plunged anew into other discomforts. Even in her own room she could hear the loud voices of her imposed suitors. I'll blow you full of holes, shouted Ross. Weaknesses, shrieked Etienne, waving his hand at the cook and me. She could not have known the previous harassed condition of the men, fretting under indoor conditions. All she knew was that where she had expected the frank Freemasonry of the West, she found the subtle tangle of two men's minds, bent upon exacting whatever romance there might be in her situation. She tried to dodge Ross and the Frenchman by spells of nursing me. They also came over to help nurse. This combination aroused such a natural state of invalid cussedness on my part that they were all forced to retire. Once she did manage to whisper, I am so worried here I don't know what to do. To which I replied, gently hitching up my shoulder, that I was a hunch savant and that the eighth house under this sign, the moon being in Virgo, showed that everything would turn out all right. But twenty minutes later I saw Etienne reading her palm and felt that perhaps I might have to recast her horoscope and try for a dark man coming with a bundle. Toward sunset, Etienne left the house for a few moments, and Ross, who had been sitting 
taciturn and morose, having unlocked Mark Twain, made another dash. It was typical Ross talk. He stood in front of her and looked down majestically at that cool and perfect spot where Miss Adams' forehead met the neat part in her fragrant hair. First, however, he cast a desperate glance at me. I was in a profound slumber. Little woman, he began, it's certainly tough for a man like me to see you bothered this way. You, gulp, you have been alone in this world too long. You need a protector. I might say that at a time like this you need a protector the worst kind, a protector who would take a three-ring delight and smash in the saffron-colored kisser off any yellow-skinned skunk that made himself obnoxious to you. Hem. Hem. I am a lonely man, Miss Adams. I have so far had to carry on my life without the, gulp, sweet radiance, gulp, of a woman around the house. I feel especially doggone lonely at a time like this, when I am pretty near locoed from having to stall indoors, and hence it was with delight I welcomed your first appearance in this here shack. Since then I have been packed jam full of more different kinds of feelings, ornery, mean, dizzy, and superb than has fallen my way in years. Miss Adams made a useless movement toward escape. The Ross chin stuck firm. I don't want to annoy you, Miss Adams, but by heck, if it comes to that, you'll have to be annoyed, and I'll have to have my say. This palm-tickling slob of a Frenchman ought to be kicked off the place, and if you'll say the word, off he goes. But I don't want to do the wrong thing. You've got to show a preference. I'm getting around to the point, Miss, Miss Willie, in my own brick fashion. I've stood about all I can stand these last two days, and something's got to happen. The suspense hereabouts is enough to hang a sheep herder. Miss Willie, he lassoed her hand by main force. Just say the word. You need somebody to take your part all your life long. Will you mar- Supper, remarked George, tersely, from the kitchen door. Miss Adams hurried away. Ross turned angrily. You, I have been revolving it in my head, said George. He brought the coffee pot forward heavily, then bravely the big platter of pork and beans, then somberly the potatoes, then profoundly the biscuits. I have been revolving it in my mind. There ain't no use waiting any longer for Swen Galley. Might as well eat now. From my excellent vantage point on the couch, I watched the progress of that meal. Ross, muddled, glowering, disappointed. Etienne, eternally blandishing, attentive, ogling. Miss Adams, nervous, picking at her food, hesitant about answering questions, almost hysterical. Now and then the solid, flitting shadow of the cook passing behind their backs like a dreadnought in a fog. I used to own a clock which gurgled in its throat three minutes before it struck the hour. I know, therefore, the slow freight of anticipation. For I have awakened at three in the morning, heard the clock gurgle, and waited those three minutes for the three strokes I knew were to come. Alors, in Ross's ranch house that night, the slow freight of climax whistled in the distance. Etienne began it after supper. Miss Adams had suddenly displayed a lively interest in the kitchen layout, and I could see her in there, chatting brightly at George, not with him, 
the while he ducked his head and rattled his pans. My friend, said Etienne, exhaling a large cloud from his cigarette and patting Ross lightly on the shoulder with a bediamonded hand which hung limp from a yard or more of bony arm. I see I must be frank with you. First, because we are rivals. Second, because you take these matters so serious. I, I am Frenchman. I love the women. He threw back his curls, bared his yellow teeth, and blew an unsavory kiss toward the kitchen. It is, I suppose, a trait of my nation. All Frenchmen love the women, pretty women. Now look, here I am. He spread out his arms. Cold outside. I detest the cold. Snow. I abominate the miserable snow. Two men. This, pointing to me, and this, pointing to Ross. I am distracted. For two old days I stand at the window and tear my air. I am nervous, upset, profoundly distressed inside my head. And suddenly, behold, a woman, a nice, pretty, charming, innocent young woman. I naturally rejoice. I become myself again, gay, light-hearted, happy. I address myself to mademoiselle. It passes the time. That, monsieur, is what the women are for. Pass the time. Entertainment, like the music, like the wine. They appeal to the mood, the caprice, the temperament. To play with this woman, follow her through her humor, pursue her. Ah, that is the most delightful way to send the hours about their business. Ross banged the table. Shut up, you miserable yeller pup, he roared. I object to your pursuing anything or anybody in my house. Now, you listen to me, you. He picked up the box of stogies and used it on the table as an emphasizer. The noise of it awoke the attention of the girl in the kitchen. Unheeded, she crept into the room. I don't know anything about your French ways of love-making, and I don't care. In my section of the country, it's the best man wins, and I'm the best man here, and don't you forget it. This girl's going to be mine. There ain't going to be any playing or philandering or palm reading about it. I've made up my mind I'll have this girl, and that settles it. My word is the law in this neck of the woods. She's mine, and as soon as she says she's mine, you pull out. The box made one final, tremendous punctuation point. Etienne's bravado was unruffled. Ah, that is no way to win a woman, he smiled easily. I make prophecy you will never win her that way, no. Not this woman. She must be played along and then kissed. This charming, delicious little creature. One kiss, and then you have her. Again he displayed his unpleasant teeth. I make you a bet I will kiss her. As a cheerful chronicler of deeds done well, it joys me to relate that the hand which fell upon Etienne's amorous lips was not his own. There was one sudden sound, as of a mule kicking a lath fence, and then, through the swinging doors of oblivion, for Etienne. I had seen this blow delivered. It was an aloof, unstudied, almost absent-minded affair. I had thought the cook was rehearsing the proper method of turning a flapjack. Silently, lost in thought, he stood there scratching his head. Then he began rolling down his sleeves. 
You'd better get your things on, miss, and we'll get out of here, he decided. Wrap up warm. I heard her heave a little sigh of relief as she went to get her cloak, sweater, and hat. Ross jumped to his feet and said, George, what are you going to do? George, who had been headed in my direction, slowly swiveled around and faced his employer. Being a camp cook, I ain't overburdened with hosses, George enlightened us. Therefore, I am going to try to borrow this feller's here. For the first time in four days, my soul gave a genuine cheer. If it's for Lochinvar purposes, go as far as you like, I said grandly. The cook studied me a moment, as if trying to find an insult in my words. No, he replied. It's for mine and the young lady's purposes, and we'll go only three miles to Hicksville. Now let me tell you something, Ross. Suddenly I was confronted with the cook's chunky back, and I heard a low, curt, carrying voice shoot through the room at my host. George had wheeled just as Ross started to speak. You're nutty. That's what's the matter with you. You can't stand the snow. You're getting nervouser and nuttier every day. That and this dago, he jerked a thumb at the half-dead Frenchman in the corner, has got you to the point where I thought I'd better horn in. I got to revolving it around in my mind, and I seen if something wasn't done, and done soon, there'd be murder around here, and maybe... His head gave an imperceptible list toward the girl's room. Worse. He stopped, but he held up a stubby finger to keep anyone else from speaking. Then he plowed slowly through the drift of his ideas. About this here woman. I know you, Ross, and I know what you really think about women. If she hadn't happened in here during this here snow, you'd never have given two thoughts to the whole woman question. Likewise, when the storm clears and you and the boys go hustling out, this here whole business'll clear out of your head and you won't think of a skirt again until kingdom come. Just because of this snow here, don't forget you're living in the self-same world you was in four days ago. And you're the same man, too. Now, what's the use of getting all snarled up over four days of sticking in the house? That there's what I've been revolving in my mind, and this here's the decision I've come to. He plodded to the door and shouted to one of the ranch hands to saddle my horse. Ross lit a stogie and stood thoughtful in the middle of the room. Then he began... I've a darn good notion, George, to knock your confounded head off and throw you into that snowbank if... You're wrong, mister. That ain't a darn good notion you've got. It's darn bad. Look here. He pointed steadily out of doors until we were both forced to follow his finger. You're in here for more than a week yet. After allowing this fact to sink in, he barked out at Ross, Can you cook? Then at me, Can you cook? Then he looked at the wreck of Etienne and sniffed. There was an embarrassing silence as Ross and I thought solemnly of a foodless week. If you just use hoss sense, concluded George, and don't go for to hurt my feelings, all I want to do is to take this young gal down to Hicksville, and then I'll head back here and cook for you. The horse and Miss Adams arrived simultaneously, both of them very serious and quiet. The horse because he knew what he had before him in that weather. The girl because of what she had left behind. Then all at once I awoke to a realization of what the cook was doing. My God, man, I cried, 
Aren't you afraid to go out in that snow? Behind my back, I heard Ross mutter, Not him. George lifted the girl daintily up behind the saddle, drew on his gloves, put his foot in the stirrup, and turned to inspect me leisurely. As I passed slowly in his review, I saw in my mind's eye the algebraic equation of snow, the equals sign, and the answer in the man before me. Snow is my last name, said George. He swung into the saddle, and they started cautiously out into the darkening swirl of fresh new currency just issuing from the snowdrop mint. The girl, to keep her place, clung happily to the sturdy figure of the camp cook. I brought three things away from Ross Curtis's ranch house. Yes, four. One was the appreciation of snow, which I have so humbly tried here to render. Two was a collarbone, of which I am extra careful. Three was a memory of what it is to eat very extremely bad food for a week, and four was the cause of three, a little note delivered at the end of the week and hand-painted in blue pencil on a sheet of meat paper. I cannot come back there to that there job. Mrs. Snow say no, George. I've been revolving it in my mind. Considering circumstances, she's right. 